Welcome to the Ghostly Gallery podcast, a place where we explore the world of horror in film, television, books, and popular culture. Well, greetings once again. My name is Bruce Markison, and as always, I'm joined by co-host Tracy Asteria. Hello, Tracy. How's it going? It's going great, Bruce. The sun was shining. Spring is here. <laughs> Beautiful. I'm so happy. <laughs> Spring is arriving in Nova Scotia. It's been a rough winter. Hard yeah. to believe, Tracy, this is our 30th program, and our guest coming up is a terrific writer, Gwendolyn Keist. We'll talk more about Gwendolyn in a few moments. But before we get to Gwendolyn, I did want to talk briefly about this new Salem's Lot controversy. This is the movie that keeps getting delayed. It was originally supposed to come out in September of 2022. That didn't happen. Then it was supposed to come out April of 2023. That didn't happen. And we still don't know exactly when Warner Brothers, which is the distributor, is going to come out with this. Maybe sometime in 2024. It apparently is not going to come out in theaters. There's been some conversation that it'll be on the Max streaming service. And all of this is rather understandably upset Stephen King, who says he's seen the movie and it's quite good. It's a weird situation, Tracy. It is. I've been reading so much about it, Bruce. Um, personally, I'm really looking forward to it, and I really hope that it comes out this year um, before people start to forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> because I would hate for that to happen. Like my understanding is they put a lot of money into it. They have a great cast and Stephen King is just, he's behind the wagon. He's just cheering this on. And, you know, it would be disappointing if they just kept it in a box and put it on a shelf for too many more years. It's been long enough, I think. Yeah, you mentioned the cast. Lewis Pullman, the son of a great actor, Bill Pullman, is set to be in the lead role of Ben Mears. Uh, William Sadler is in the film, too, is an excellent character actor. He's done a lot of horror films over the years. It just keeps getting delayed. Uh, I've heard kind of wacky theories, and I, I guess a lot of this has has to do with me not understanding business, but one theory I've heard is that well, they don't think the film is that good, so they want to release it at the worst possible time so nobody sees it. Well, that to me, that doesn't make sense. You know, you, you don't want people to see the movie at all, even though Stephen King has endorsed it. I've even heard one theory that they don't want to release the movie. Warner Brothers doesn't want to come out with the movie at all because they want to make it a tax write-off. I guess I don't really understand write-offs and what the financial benefit of having put all this money into a movie and then not coming out with it. Uh, maybe there's some sort of a tax advantage to that. It's just, it's very strange. And it's frustrating for horror fans like us because we're always looking for good stuff that's out there. Oh, exactly. And, you know, I kind of missed the remake back in, I think I want to say it was 2004 and it was right. with Rob Lowe. Like I totally missed that one. Um, I looked for it, still can't find it. So, you know, this new one would mean the world to me. I, I would love to see it. I'm not usually a big remake fan, but anything that's got Stephen King's stamp of approval, I'm all over it. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I'm a big fan of the original that came out in 1979 with uh, the late David Soul. James Mason was great in that. I did see the 04 one with, with Rob Lowe when it was uh, on television in 04. Mm -hmm. But, man, that's 20 years ago. I don't remember that much about it. I know it wasn't as good as the original, but it, it wasn't terrible either. Uh, I'm like you, though. I'm, I'm looking forward to the remake. Well, waiting patiently as we sift through this is our featured guest this week for episode number 30, and we thank Gwendolyn Keist for joining us. Gwendolyn's an award-winning author. Uh, by my count, she has written seven books, including her brand new novel, The Haunting of Velkwood. Gwendolyn is a three-time winner of the prestigious Bram Stoker Award and also a leading historian on both horror literature and films. Gwendolyn, thanks for your patience. Welcome to the Ghostly Gallery. Man, I'm so excited to be here. I didn't know all of that about the new Salem's Lot. Now I'm like, hey, it needs to be released. Like, I'm already on board. I didn't even know it existed a few minutes ago. And I'm like, they should release it. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So Gwendolyn, let's let's get the thoughts on your career and really how it started. At what point did you decide that you wanted to become a writer of horror? Were you very young? How and when did this come about for you? Always been a horror fan. You know, my dad like recited Poe to me from the time like my mom was pregnant. So it's like I always say like I was I was a horror fan before birth. Like I I got started really young. And, you know, I've always loved horror. My dad and I would watch Hammer Horror and Universal Horror when I was growing up. And, you know, Ray Bradbury and Edgar Allan Poe and all, all of this great stuff. So yeah, it's definitely always been a genre that I've loved. It's always been my favorite genre. And, you know, I got writing fairly young. So it's always been a thing that I've, I've wanted to do. And yeah, about now, like 10 years ago, 10 years ago was my first published uh, short story. And so it's been 10 years that I'm like officially a horror writer. So, you know, even though unofficially since, yeah, like I was a little kid, but officially for 10 years now. <laughs> when you were in elementary and high school, were you the kind of student who, like me, was looking to turn a writing project into something related to monsters? Were you that kind of student? Could, yeah. Like there wasn't a lot. I feel like there wasn't a ton of opportunity, but I do remember like this is morbid now. It's so morbid. But, you know, I was a little kid always looking for things. And we had to do like a research project on something. And I was like, Salem Witch Trial, because it, it was like spooky and scary. And, you know, obviously really sad, too. But you're a little kid. And you're like, if I have to do something that's based on something real, like that was something that seems scary and kind of horror related to me. So yeah, always, I was always trying to find that way in of like, how can I, how can I, you know, make this into something spooky or creepy or weird? <laughs> You mentioned your first published story 10 years ago. Do you remember exactly what it was? Oh, absolutely. It was called Bedroom Bureau, and it was in an anthology called Strangely Funny 2. And so it was it was horror, but it was like horror comedy. And it was about this uh, girl who had who her family had this house that had like a portal to like a demon dimension. But she was like the bureaucrat that had to decide whether or not to let people in. So like people would be like, Oh, can I come in? And they're like, No, you're gonna cause too many problems. And so there was like, you know, this like disembodied head that would try to get through sometimes and like, you know, and then one day somebody comes in there wanting to like buy up her property, like, you know, kind of like right away. And she's like, you don't understand, you can't do that. So that's like the the kind of story, the, the kind of crux of the story. So yeah, horror comedy, but definitely horror related demons and whatnot. <laughs> As you look back at that article, do you think it's pretty good? You know, I think, I, it, but I always think I haven't written enough horror comedy. Like a lot of my stuff can be very dark and like kind of gloomy and creepy and gothic. But I like, I think back to that one. I'm like, I need to do more horror comedy because I love horror comedy. I think it can be really fun. Yeah. You mentioned to me in an email that two of the writers, horror writers that really influenced you, you mentioned Ray Bradbury a moment ago, and the other Shirley Jackson. Tell us about those two. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, again, both my parents are, are big Ray Bradbury fans. And so like, I feel like I was introduced to Ray Bradbury fairly young through a lot of his short fiction, really, before I even learned about his novels. And then also that Ray Bradbury, like, TV show that was on in, like, the 80s and 90s. Like, that was, like, a really interesting, like, creepy little show that definitely, I feel like, scarred me as a kid. There's that one with the skeleton. And, like, he, like, loses his skeleton. And, like, he's just... The, the spoiler for this, like, 35-year-old show, he's, like, a puddle of goo at the end. And, like, I thought that that could happen because I was, like, seven or eight. Like, anything's possible when you're that age, right? Like, I feel like you, you don't understand that's not going to happen and my parents are trying to explain to me but like it definitely scarred me for life but like I love Bradbury and I actually love a lot of his like more autumnal stuff like you know stuff from the October country and kind of like the stuff that maybe isn't as scary although I love his scary stuff too but and something wicked this way comes is fairly scary but it's also got that just beautiful kind of coming of age so those are the things that i always think of with bradbury and i i just love his work and i grew up thinking about bradbury and reading bradbury and watching bradbury so that's definitely you know kind of got a nostalgia with shirley jackson i didn't come to her work until i was like you know an adult and really got into her stuff you know once i was out of college and everything and i i love we have always lived in the castle to me it's such a perfect novel because it's short it's weird it's whimsical but it's definitely it, it's creepy it's weird and i i always go back to that book and it 
it's just so brilliant to me. And it's it it's such a simple book and such a complicated book at the same time. And I, I love it so much for that. So yeah, those are two two big ones for me, Shirley Jackson and Ray Bradby. I feel like I could talk about them. Like anytime I get a chance to talk about them, I'll just gush for like ever about them because I adore them so much. What about The Haunting of Hill House? Do I do really love it. And obviously my book, The Hunting of Velkwood, is paying homage to to it through the title. I, you know, it's great. I, I feel like it I feel like everybody loves it. I feel like it's the it's the haunted house story that all other haunted house stories are trying to aspire to be, right? And so it's just it, it's so interesting and it's so much about a person being haunted as much as the house being haunted and you know, the people in it the way that they they have their own ghosts. And so that is such an interesting concept to me. I'm curious about being a, a female writer in the genre of horror. And we're, we're seeing more and more writers, uh, uh, female writers that are, are coming along. And certainly someone like Anne Rice uh, is influential in that area. I'm curious, as you you know, were young and deciding you wanted to write about horror, were people encouraging, discouraging, or kind of neutral? My, I would say very encouraging. My dad, especially, because he's a writer as well. So it was definitely something that, you know, we bonded over when I was very young. So always very encouraging. And I, I think back, like any teachers I had, I, I very much felt, in, you know, encouraged with it. I don't know that I did a ton of horror writing necessarily in school, but I did do a lot of writing. And I do feel like teachers were were encouraging of it and everything. So. Yeah. And, you know, I would think back on people like Mary Shelley, you know, I feel like Frankenstein, you know, she was kind of like the, the original. Right. And so I, I looked at that as, you know, there were definitely a lot of female writers who've done a lot of great horror. And then the Gothic, the Brontes obviously did such great work in the Gothic. So I would kind of look back to that, that even if there weren't, aren't as many, maybe, you know, throughout history or at least things that have stayed in print because there were a lot of horror you know writers throughout the years and some some books just don't stay in print so we kind of don't think about them or talk about them as much anymore but you are right there's definitely a lot of female horror writers now which is so exciting to see and really be a part of uh you mentioned mary shelley and frankenstein i mean that's that's right at the top of the list that's up there with stoker's dracula you know in my top three or top five was Anne Rice an influence for you at all? I didn't read her stuff. I, I, I still haven't read enough of it, to be completely honest, you know, but I didn't read it when I was young. But I did see Interview with a Vampire when I was fairly young, probably too young when I look back on it. But I was very much aware of her work. And so very, absolutely, I loved Interview with a Vampire. I thought it was just great. I loved I loved the movie version of it. And, and I thought about it a lot and watched it a lot as a kid. So yeah, she was definitely there. She was definitely somebody that, that felt like it was just kind of part of that tapestry of horror. Oh my gosh. You have had so many wonderful influences from teachers to, to your dad. Like that's incredible. That is really heartwarming to hear. Um, but I'm curious, did you ever have a chance to meet any writers that did influence you? And if not, is there a particular writer that you would actually love to meet in person, just sit down and have a really good conversation about it? Ooh, I don't think there have been any writers that I've met that were very influential. I do remember there was a time that Ray Bradbury was speaking in Akron and like that was like an hour away from us. And like we debated going up, but it was like a school night. And it was one of those things that it was like, I was like a teenager. We talked about it. We didn't end up doing it. And, you know, I go back and forth because sometimes I think when you meet the people that influence you, it can change a little bit. And it's almost to me like sometimes I'm like, oh, that would have been really cool to go. And, you know, maybe get something signed by Ray Bradbury. But then I'm like, I almost like it better that he's almost like this mystical figure for me. He's almost magical. And so, you know, you meet somebody and, and it's, you know, we're all just people, right? So I feel like there's something in that that I kind of like leaving it as this magical, this magical human that has influenced me and inspired me. So I don't know that anybody, you know, that Ray Bradbury would have been great. Shirley Jackson would have been great, of course, right. you know, but 
nobody else, nobody necessarily that I'm like, yes, I absolutely have to meet them. I think it's fun to just have them be somebody who's like, you know, got this almost supernatural quality about them. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's an excellent perspective though. I kind of didn't see it that way, but you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think about some of the people that I've met that have been influences and I'd be like, yeah, well, maybe. <laughs> so that's an excellent point. <laughs> you know, that's interesting. Um, meeting people that you admire. And we've had a chance to meet some people through this show. We've had 20 odd something guests and everybody has been really cordial and open and enthusiastic about being on the show. And I go to a lot of horror conventions too. And I've met some of the actors and actresses, people like D. Wallace and Adrian Barbeau, the late Sid Haig. And they're just always cordial and down to earth, willing to talk, regular people. I don't know what it is about the horror genre, but it just seems like the quality of people is there. They're nothing like the monsters that they write about or that they portray on screen. So um, for me, it's been a good experience. But yeah, there's always that possibility of running into somebody that you admire. And then you find out, well, he's kind of a jerk. So uh, (laughs) that can happen too. Gwendolyn, let's talk about your new book coming out March of 2024, uh, The Haunting of Velkwood. It's your seventh book. It's about three childhood friends who kind of miraculously survive the night when everyone on their street turns into ghosts. Tell us the idea for this story. How did that begin? Yeah. So like, I've always found suburbia to be kind of like creepy and a little haunted in its own way. And I just thought it would be so interesting to like create this neighborhood that, that is haunted. I, you don't see, I, I haven't, don't think I've ever come across a haunted neighborhood and you can come across a ghost town or a haunted house or a haunted person, but I'm like, Oh, like a, like a block of, of, these houses being haunted just seemed like something really interesting that I'd never seen done. So I was just very excited to be like, okay, like I'm gonna, I want to be the one to like experiment with this and see what this looks like, you know, as, as a horror novel. So that was really where, where it started. And how long ago did you come up with the idea? How many years did it take to get this all on paper? You know, it really, it only probably took, you know, I'm trying to think it was about two and a half years ago when I, when I came up with it and, you know, it took maybe about six months to write, you know, the draft that I sent over to my editor. And then we spent a few months doing edits and, you know, back and forth and everything. So yeah, not, not so long, you know, it wasn't something I lived with for a real long time, but it was definitely, again, like that kind of haunted, creepy suburbia is definitely an idea I've carried with me for a long time. So the, the three childhood friends they they survive this this crazy night and they end up coming back to the neighborhood is that what happens yes yes so what happens is they leave because they're all in college and they go back to college on like a sunday night and monday morning is when everybody disappears like the, the whole neighborhood just turns into a ghost nobody can kind of get past this impenetrable border except the three of them and they realize this when one of them does try to go back a few years later and doesn't go well. Nobody knows exactly what happened. She doesn't talk about it. And she's kind of become a recluse at this point. That's the character of Grace. And meanwhile, Brett and Talitha, who are who are closer but have a kind of complicated relationship, they uh they haven't visited yet uh, again since it happened. But at the start of this book, that's when Talitha, the main character, decides, okay, I'm I'm gonna go back. A researcher comes and and offers her, you know an incentive to get back into the neighborhood and she's like okay i want to kind of settle settle the settle with the past settle with these ghosts once and for all so yeah i've been reading the first chapter and this researcher this guy named jack from this yes. mysterious organization <laughs> goes up i don't want you to give too much away here but i kind of get the sense reading that first chapter that He's not being completely honest. He may be a little nefarious. Uh, am, am I way off base here? Uh, there may be there may be some secrets. There may be yeah. some secrets. Yes, I think so. I think that's fair to say, right? I feel like yeah. you know it's a mysterious story and a mysterious neighborhood, and the people involved are, you know, maybe not telling Talitha everything she needs to know. 
So she's obviously involved in the first chapter. When do the the other two girls, who are, well, and they're now women by this point, when do they come into the story? You know, she talks to Brett a little bit back and forth, but, you know, it, it kind of unfolds a, as it goes along. You know, some things happen and it kind of, they all sort of start deciding, you know, are we going to go back in the neighborhood together or no? And, you know, Talitha is the only one at this point that's like, okay, this is re- the researcher Jack has already tried to get Grace and Brett to go back. And they're like, no, we are not going back. And so Talitha's kind of like his last hope. And so she decides to go back and keeps trying to convince the other two to come back, but they do not want to. <laughs> Any of these three characters based on friends of yours? There's probably aspects of them, right? Like, I feel like anytime you're writing a story that's, you know, got even a coming of age element to it, you're probably thinking back to, you know, your own, your own coming of age, your own teenage years, but not nothing in particular, nothing that I'm like, Brett is this person or Grace is this person, but definitely probably elements that I've, that I've integrated, maybe not even realizing it. Right. Yeah. When you came to the finish of writing the book. How satisfied were you with what you produced? Be with it. I'm, I'm, you know, especially once, you know, going through the editing process with my editor, that that's always fun to see a kind of really, you know, getting it to that final polish is always really gratifying and really exciting to, to get to that point. So yeah, I was very happy with it. I'm very happy with, you know, what we, what we put out there, what's going to be coming out on Tuesday now. That's when we're recording this just a few days away. Yeah, It's always yeah. exciting. <laughs> You know, I'm curious, Gwendolyn, when you're writing fiction, and I'm a writer too, although more of a baseball writer, I I work at the Hall of Fame, and I've written some um, uh, nonfiction biographies of baseball players, and and that has its challenges. And I've tried writing some fiction. I just think it's so hard to do. You have to create everything from scratch. There's, There's really no opportunity to kind of research through newspapers or magazines. You're, you're creating this out of whole cloth. I just think it's really difficult. Uh, obviously, though, you're pretty good at it. How are you able to to do this seven times over? <laughs> I love that you say seven, because when you said that, I'm like, well, it's four novels and then a collection and then a novella and then a novelette. I'm like, yes, that's seven. Yes. Yeah. And I love that, that you knew that. And I'm like, I'm not really sure how many books I have at this point. You know, one of the things for me is to find those real world details to really ground it. I've I've written a lot of historical horror and trying to find things that you can say, okay, these were real. These did happen. How do we incorporate these into it? And that really can help to ground the overall story. And that that makes it, I think, a lot easier. Yeah. I'm also curious about this. And I've asked this of other authors and I get different answers. When you start writing, Do you have a complete outline in your head about what's going to happen, how it's going to finish? Or does the story evolve and come to you as you're writing? What's that process like? Be both. I think it can absolutely be both. I feel like my work has definitely gone in both directions before, that there have been things that, yeah, like that I'm absolutely planned out. And then other things that it's like, no, I, you know, I just kind of let it go the direction that it goes. With my short fiction, I tend to allow it to just evolve naturally. Whereas with my longer fiction, my novels and my novellas, I try to plan it out more just because it can become so much more unwieldy if you don't. I'm curious, have you ever had an experience with a ghost? Just with the writings that you've had, did, have you had any personal experiences or encounters? Here and there. I do remember that when I finished the title story for my collection, and I always said, you know, I, maybe it was just because I was tired. Because, you know, it was like I just finished this story and it, was, it took a lot out of me. And I remember walking along my the hallway and just like glanced down the, the other side of the hallway. And there was just like a pillar of light standing there, just a pillar of light. And I remember being like, because I was so tired, I'm like, that's nice. I'm just going to keep walking now. I don't want to have anything to do with that right now. I'm not up for that. So yeah. And I think it was interesting because it was a very ghostly story to have something kind of ghostly happen. But again, it may have just been because I was tired. That's an absolute possibility. Oh, my gosh. But you're definitely a, a believer of ghosts. I, You know, I, I think I'm open to the possibility. I'll say that. I'm definitely open to the possibility. I'm very happy with that. Yeah. That's a good answer. Oh, <laughs> thank you for sharing that. 
<laughs> I'm especially glad you said that because I do ghost tours here in Cooperstown where I live. So, oh, yay. <laughs> yeah. Gives it some legitimacy. Hey. <laughs> One other question about your new book, The Haunting of Velkwood. Uh, the name Velkwood, where does that come from? Is that is that a street in your neighborhood you grew up or that was just, again, something you completely made up? I'm pretty sure I completely made it up. I remember looking at the time I, I, you know, was thinking, I was thinking again of Shirley Jackson and the family and we have always lived in the castle is Blackwood. And I was thinking, oh, it'd be cool to come up with something that's got a kind of ring to it like that. And I came up with Velkwood and I'm like, that's interesting. Did I hear that somewhere? And I remember looking it up on Google and at least at the time, nothing really came up. Definitely nothing that I'd ever seen. And I'm like, oh, I think this is mine. So I was all happy that I could be like, okay, this is like my word. This is my word now. So yeah, like it just sounded like really neat to me. I liked the sound of it. I remember kind of going through different ideas and I hit on that and I'm like, okay, I like this. We'll talk a little bit more about the book toward the tail end of the conversation, but The Haunting of Velkwood uh, will be out by the time that this uh, broadcast airs. And uh, I know that's always exciting for an author when the new book is is in print and uh, available to people. Let's talk also, Gwendolyn, about Your last book, uh, which came out in 2023, so just last year, and I know that you're proud of it for good reason. It's called Reluctant Immortals, uh, winner of the Lambda Literary Award. This is different, Mm -hmm. though, from the Velkwood book in that it's historical fiction. It's inspired Mm -hmm. by two characters from classic literature. We have Lucy Westenra, one of the victims in Bram Stoker's Dracula, and then also the character of Bertha Mason. Uh, that was the uh, uh, attic bound wife of mm-hmm. the character Rochester in the Jane Eyre book. Uh, you place these two characters, uh, Westenra and Mason, in 1967 in San Francisco. So, how exactly do they get there? <laughs> well, they are the reluctant immortals of the title. So, you know, they've been alive since since the 1800s and they wanted to get away from where they came from. So that that was, you know, ending up in, in California in the 1960s, which is a pretty far cry from Victorian times in England, I think. So, yeah, yeah, I loved both of those characters. And I remember, you know, I wrote separate stories, like short stories that featured each of them. And I'm like, oh, I would love to see these two characters together. It would be so much fun to see, like, what Lucy and Bertha, she goes by in, in Reluctant Immortals, the nickname of B would like be up to. And I'm like, oh, I could write that story. That's the thing I could do. Like, it was interesting to kind of be like, you know, well, I'm a writer. I could just find out myself. So that was really how that one, that one started. And that one was a lot of fun to write because I always thought of it as kind of like my own feminist take on a hammer films, like from that era. I love hammer films. And I imagined it very much as like this technicolor, you know, fun, psychedelic, look to it. And so that was a lot of fun. I watched a lot of Hammer movies and research for that, which was so great. I remember writing that during the pandemic, during the early pandemic, when my husband and I were both working from home. We both still work from home, but it was like the early days of working from home. We're just watching all these Hammer movies. And I'm like, you know, if you're going to be stuck at home, like it's pretty fun to be with your spouse just watching Hammer movies for research. (laughs) So that was a good way to spend those early days. Yeah. (laughs) When you were writing this, was there a particular Hammer film that was kind of in your mind? You know, I love I love a lot of them. I love pretty much all the Dracula ones, but horror, like Horror of Dracula, the original, the first one, you know, I just, I that's my favorite. I just think it's so beautiful. I think it's, it, it is not a faithful adaptation of Bram Stoker's novel really at all, but I love it so much. It's probably still my favorite Dracula movie just because I think it, it takes the pieces and kind of puts them back together in a different way, which is really what I was doing with Reluctant Immortals with Dracula and Jane Eyre. So it felt like, you know, a fair comparison in that way. So in this book, is Lucy a vampire? Yes, Lucy is a vampire and Bertha is a different kind of immortal that we sort of find out more about as it goes along. And are they friends, enemies? They are. The two of them are definitely friends. They feel like they they both have this kind of common experience of having this these these men who treated them very badly, Dracula and Rochester. So and of course they show up again. That is the crux of the story. They show up Dracula and Rochester show up back in their lives to cause problems. So, yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> and now that they're in 1967 San Francisco, do they encounter any celebrities, any other well-known people? I'm trying to think. They they do at one point. I don't think this is too much of a spoiler. They do end up like in uh in in a music venue where like just Jeff, Jefferson Airplane is playing. So they get to like, you know, even though they're not really that like hip to what the kids are into, because they're like sort of feeling out of time, but they they do sort of cross some paths with like, you know, things like that and the music scene and everything at the time. Why did you pick 67 San Francisco? Uh, it was just before the the horrific Manson murders, the yeah. murders of Sharon Tate and, and so many other people at the hands of his so-called family. Was that a factor? What what was it about San Francisco late 60s? Actually starts in L.A., then they go to San Francisco. And then they actually, I mean, this isn't too much of a spoiler, they end up back in L.A. Right. And so, you know, that that entire kind of California that, you know, Southern California, San Francisco is not really Southern California, but half of California, let's say part of California. Really, I like the vibe of both cities at the time because it's a very different. The 60s in L.A. and Hollywood was different than the 60s in San Francisco, especially in like Haight-Ashbury. So I thought it was interesting to like contrast that, that even though we think of it as being kind of monolithic, it's really not. It was it was a different type of research for each one. But in terms of that, I'm a huge Sharon Tate fan. I'm actually a huge Sharon Tate fan. The uh, t- title story in my collection, the one that I had the weird ghostly experience with, is actually inspired by her. I'm, I've been a fan of her since I, I was a kid. I loved, I loved her in Fearless Vampire Killers. I loved her in Eye of the Devil. I think she's a very talented actress that never really, you know, her death overshadowed all the work that she did. And so I do think, you know, there's kind of like a cult vibe in Reluctant Immortal. So there was definitely a kind of Manson vibe in general. But one of the things that was interesting in the research I did was there were a number of cults in in California at that time. It wasn't just the Manson family. You know, there were other groups. And you're, you're able to find those documentaries of people. They, they weren't usually as bad as what happened with the Manson family, right? Like most of that's, you know... That that's like the extreme version of of what happens with cults, but there were definitely other ones that there's some weird stories of that time that it seemed to just form cults. It seemed to have these people who were looking for answers, and people were saying, "Oh, I've got these answers," and whether or not they had any answers is a whole another whole another question. But it it was interesting to kind of realize that as much as we have this idea of Charles Manson, that it was kind of part of this larger you know, dynamic that was happening at the time and kind of writing my story with that in in mind. I want to spend a moment more on Sharon Tate, whose career was was fascinating, even though it was so tragically brief. And you mentioned her performance in Eye of the Devil, uh, where she plays uh, a witch Mm -hmm. and she's phenomenal in the in the movie. Now, you know, a lot of people have talked about, you know, she's one of the most beautiful actresses of all time. Mm-hmm. And and that's true. But mm-hmm. I think she really would have been an A-list star just based on her mm-hmm. acting ability if she had had that chance. And mm-hmm. a lot of it is because of that movie, Eye of the Devil. She's great in that. She's so great in it. And I, it makes me sad that more people don't talk about that movie because it it's a really interesting film. It's a lot like The Wicker Man, even though it predates it by many years and she is so interesting in it like my husband and i just the other day we were like quoting it because you know, she talks about the clouds at one point and we were like looking at the clouds and we we're like quoting her from that movie because it's like she's so ethereal and strange and really steals the scenes from everyone else in it and there's like david niven and deborah carr and, <laughs> and yet when sharon tate is there like you can't take your eyes off her she's so interesting and i i agree i think with time and with, you know, getting good roles, I think she would have really proven herself to be a great actress because like you said, she proved herself to be a great actress in the little bit that we saw her in as, as film fans. Yeah. It's just, it's so sad. It's one of the great tragedies in Hollywood history and, and it is difficult to talk about, but also certainly worthwhile to talk about. So in, in putting this book together, Reluctant Immortals, obviously Dracula, Jane Eyre are, influences are these your two favorite gothic books of all time i don't know they're definitely among my two favorites for sure absolutely you know and i definitely love the characters so much from them so 
definitely top 10, probably top five, maybe even my favorite. But again, I, I do love Shirley Jackson's work and Ray Bradbury's work. So I don't want to be like, no. And I love Angela Carter bring her up as well. I think The Bloody Chamber is such a great collection of stories. So that's a great one too. Hmm. Would you happen to have any advice for our listeners about um, just any guidance for writing for any of our budding authors that are out there in our listening world? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I would say, you know, write the story. This is the advice I always give, but it's the advice I always give myself. Write the story you want to read. Because I think that not only if that story doesn't exist and, you know, you want it to exist, be the person to write that story. Because one, you'll bring so much passion to it. It'll be something that you believe in. It'll get you through the points where you're like, I don't want to write today, but you'll love the story so much that you'll you'll get back to it. And it'll also be something that'll be un- uniquely yours. And I feel like, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, well, what should I write? You know, should I write to what is popular right now? But Trends change so much. You never know if by the time something gets published, whatever the trend is, it's just going to have passed. So write the things that you believe in and write the things that you absolutely love. And I feel like you'll you'll be a happier writer and you're, you'll have happier readers. <laughs> oh, gosh, that's excellent advice. Thank you. Thank you. Gwendolyn, do you write every day? Try to, but I'm not going to like sit here and be like, yes, I write every day. Like some days I don't. I would like to write every day, but you know, I try to do some, I definitely do writing related things every day, right? Like I, you know, if it's research or if, you know, I do a lot of nonfiction writing. So I, you know, I'll, I'll write that. And that obviously counts too. But in terms of writing fiction, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily write fiction every day, but I'm usually working on something related to it every day. You know, it's funny. I, I find that social media is actually helpful in this area in that I write every day. I write Facebook posts for the Ghostly Gallery Facebook page, and, and I write on Twitter as as much as Twitter is so limiting in, in how much you're able to write. And there's always a lot of um, controversy uh, and, uh, and a lot of nonsense that you have to wade through in getting through that app. Yeah. Um, but these are opportunities to write. And it, even even if that's the only writing I do in a given day, I, I find it helps. You know, I would agree with that. And also just being surrounded by other writers can be inspiring, too. You know, you find out about their pro- projects and, you know, just being connected to people can be helpful and being like, yeah, you know, I'm part of this community. I'm part of this, you know, bunch of people who love horror, which is always nice. So, yeah, yeah. I would agree with all that. Well, in addition to being a writer, you're obviously a big fan of the horror genre in general, and you love watching horror uh, movies, television as well. Uh, You're a big fan of both Universal Studios classics and the Hammer films, which you mentioned a moment ago. So let's start, Gwendolyn, with Universal. If I had to ask you to name a favorite movie from those classic films from the 30s, 40s, and 50s for Universal, what would it be? It would be either Bride of Frankenstein or The Old Dark House. So James Whale, I just love the stuff that, that he did. And Frankenstein is great, too. But I think Bride of Frankenstein is so much weirder. I think it's a weirder movie. It's And I, of course, love Elsa Lanchester and as, as, the, as the bride, you know, even though she's not in it enough. I remember as a kid watching it for the first time. Actually, the first time I watched Bride of Frankenstein, I didn't like it because I thought the Bride of Frankenstein was going to be in it a lot. And my dad warned me, he's like, she's only in it at the end. And I don't know why I didn't believe him. I'm like, I'm sure he's wrong. He must not be remembering it right. She's in the title. He was remembering it right. And so I remember the first time I saw it, I was kind of disappointed. But then as I got older and saw it again and appreciated what it was doing. But I definitely think when I was little, I would have said I liked Frankenstein better than Bride of Frankenstein for that reason. I felt cheated as a little kid. (laughs) But I I love it now. I, I really love, I love both of them. But I I definitely love Bride of Frankenstein so much. And then The Old Dark House is just so much fun. It's such a silly, weird little movie, and I just adore it. And I didn't see that one till I was an adult. I may have been in my 30s before I saw that one, which kind of stunned me that I hadn't come across it until then. And I was so happy when I saw it. I'm like, this is so cool to me that there's this movie with all these actors that I'd seen in other things over the years that are in this weird haunted house, but it's not exactly a haunted house. It's more just like with the the people are weird. It's a great movie and it's so strange. And I'm so happy. 
it's the type of movie I'm just happy to live in a world where it exists. I love that. It just makes me happy to be like the old dark house exists in this world. No matter how bad this world is, this world is the old dark house. And that's pretty cool. You know, it's interesting you oh. mentioned those those two movies because they have two common threads, Boris Karloff and Ernest Thesiger. And they play, you know, two very different characters in, in mm-hmm. each in each of the films. Uh, but The Old Dark House is extremely funny. And Thesiger is a big reason for that. Uh, yeah. He's just an absolute nut. He's an absolute weirdo from top to bottom. I love the yes. scene where he's he's taking one of the other people upstairs and I can't remember what what they're trying to do. He's they're going up to get a lamp or something. Yeah, it's and, yeah. It's and really just like, an excuse to go upstairs. There's not a good reason for it. Yeah, yeah. And then halfway up, he's like, um, uh, "Maybe we shouldn't go up there. Let's let's tell them a story that uh, uh, we we'll have to go back downstairs." He's just out of his mind. You don't know what he's talking about half the time, but it's hysterical. Oh, it's so true. I love him. I love. I, I love I love the whole family. Like they're so they're so frightening and strange. <laughs> yeah. And then there's the um the character who uh looks to be about 130 years old. And it's supposed to be a male character in the movie, but it's yeah. actually someone played by an actress. Yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's a very it's just such a a wonderful movie and like the set is so beautiful and the acting is incredible and yeah yeah I just I love it I, it it's it's such a and I also love the fact that it's such a trope it's literally an old dark house story like that's that's the basic plot is that they get stranded in this house in the middle of a storm and a bunch of people end up stranded there and then weird things happen. So it's like the plot itself is very thin. There's not like a lot in terms of, you know, it's very basic, but I think I love it so much because it's still so interesting. And it seems like something that simple would be like, oh, you know, we've seen this before, but they're able to do so many weird things with it, almost within this framework of how simple it is. And that that's like really inspiring to me as a storyteller to be able to see something that seems so basic and, oh, we've seen this before. And that, you know, you've never seen anything quite like the old dark house. That's for sure. Like there's nothing else out there like it. And that that's so neat to me. What'd you think of Karloff as the drunken butler Morgan? Scary. I, he is so much scarier in that than I think he is in Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein. Because I obviously don't think he's really scary in Bride of Frankenstein or Frankenstein. He's tragic, right? But like he's scary as Morgan. Morgan terrifies me. Like every time I think of him, like Karloff was so mean in that. He's so scary. Yeah. <laughs> Terrorizing the girls. <laughs> Yeah, and then he goes into the kitchen and he just starts wrecking things for no reason. He starts throwing pots and pans all over the place. Yeah. He's a maniac. He is. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's great, though. It really is. Let's talk a little bit about a Hammer. You mentioned earlier that you like horror of Dracula. Any other Hammer films that are near the top of your list? Yeah, I mean, for sure. Like, you know, I, I, I love all of the of the vampire ones. Bride, Brides of Dracula is great. You know, I... <sighs> this is Hammer, correct? I, I'm pretty sure it's Hammer. It is. And I absolutely. adore that one. That one is such a fun one. I haven't seen it in years. I need to rewatch it now that I'm talking about it. Like, I love that one. I wish they'd made more. It was left open-ended, and it seemed like they might make more, but then I don't think they ever did anything else with it. And that's sad, because it was a neat movie. And that's, like, such a... I love the Hammer movies that are kind of like horror adventure movies, that it's, like, there's definitely horror elements, but it almost feels like an adventure story. Because I love, like, you know, I grew up... Remember one of the earliest movies I remember seeing was, you know, Robin Hood with Errol Flynn. And I loved the kind of adventure element of it. And it was always neat to see these Technicolor horror movies that almost felt like in the spirit of some of those adventure movies from from classic Hollywood. But then you've got monsters in them. So it's like it was like the best of every world. So <laughs> I'm curious if you've seen a Christopher Lee movie, The Devil Rides Out, also from Hammer. Not and my my dad and I were talking about this not that long ago. I don't think he had seen it either. I think he might have seen it now, but I have not seen that one, and I would definitely like to. I need to. It's like on my list. It's really the best film that they did in the area of satanic worship and witchcraft, and it's unusual in that Christopher Lee is a good guy through and through. He's very heroic from start to finish. 
it's it's one of my favorites. It's really, really good. So I think you'd enjoy so there's, it. There's definitely some Hammer movies I haven't seen. And it's almost like sometimes I like to save them because I'm like, there aren't any more classic Hammer movies that are going to be produced. And sometimes I like the idea of like, oh, I haven't seen that one yet. I'll save it. But I do need to get to that one because I've heard great things about it and I haven't seen it. Gwendolyn, another area of interest that you told me about was body horror. And that's something we haven't really talked about in any of our shows yet. So this was something that I think became really popular in the 1980s. Mm-hmm. And it certainly brings to mind the films of David Cronenberg. And we would see things happen to, you know, sometimes good people, sometimes bad people, these transformations of their body. A lot of it very graphic. Some of it difficult for some viewers to stomach. Mm -hmm. But you're a big fan of Cronenberg. So I wanted to talk about a few of his movies and get your thoughts. The first one that comes to mind, 1979, The Brood. Oh, I love that one. That is probably my favorite Cronenberg movie. I just think that that one is so creepy. I I love the idea that it's really about a family that's breaking up. It's about a family that's disintegrating. And I think that that's such an interesting way of exploring it with these like horrible like creatures that, you know, are being birthed out of this pain. And I I think that's one of the things I love about body horror is the idea that it can be an expression of, you know, emotional pain or trauma and that it's this, you know, horrible visual representation of that trauma. And I think that movie does it so well. So yeah, that one's that one's definitely one of my favorites. I think my husband and I just rewatched it in the last couple of months because I think it was on the Criterion channel. And I'm like, oh, an excuse to watch The Brood. Let's do it. <laughs> when you watched it for the first time, was it was it a little bit difficult for you to stomach it? So, I mean, I think I knew going into it, you know, what Cronenberg was like. And I actually, I mean, I think The Fly is, his remake of The Fly is more visceral and visual yeah. than than The Brood is. I'm trying to remember, I, I think I saw The Brood for the first time maybe 15 years ago now, 10 or 15 years ago. It wasn't one of the first Cronenberg movies I saw. I think I saw The Fly first. Okay. I'm trying to remember, like, it's always interesting. You can come to movies from directors that you ultimately love in such strange order. Like, you kind of can randomly see one, and then you'll randomly see another, and then it's like, okay, I really like this. But yeah, I remember, I think The Brood was the first time I was like, I really like David Cronenberg, because I really like this movie, and I'm starting to kind of click with what I think he's kind of going for in this, you know, in this body of work. So, yeah. You know, I'm not normally a person that gets creeped out by horror films because I've seen so many of them over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I was young, night of the living dead kind of freaked me out. The first time I watched it, I was home alone at night. I don't know why I decided to watch under those circumstances, but then a film like the fly, I had difficulty getting through it. And it, it was so physically graphic and revolting Mm. that um, I really, I don't know if I could really stomach it. It, And I I haven't watched it since. What are your thoughts on it? You know, I'm, I may have only seen the fly once. I may have seen it twice. I can't remember for sure. I, I remember seeing it and absolutely loving it, but feeling that it's very intense and the reason it makes me so sad and that I struggle with it is because you really like these characters. This is not a situation that, like you said, it's not, bad things happening to bad people where you're like, okay, I can kind of deal with this. You know, you really like these characters. You really like Seth and Veronica and you really want them to have good things happen to them. And that is not what this story is about. And that is actually what makes it so hard for me is to, is to have, because we're really seeing it through her eyes, through Gina Davis's character's eyes and watching someone you love just fall, literally fall apart and, and, and die in front of you. It's a lot. It's a lot. I still, I would still say it's one of my favorite movies, but I may have only seen it all the way through once because it's such an intense film and it's so hard to watch. A film from the early 80s that people still talk about a lot to this day, Scanners. Yes, yes. I mean, I'm not of that one as I am the fly and the brood but the effects are great that one really feels to me like I mean we were talking about remakes at the start of this episode that feels like something that would have been great as like a limited series like one of those like Netflix or Hulu limited series because it feels like there's more to that world than we get to see in like the hour and a half or two hours there's so much of like this kind of like conspiracy with like the company and there's 
such an involved backstory that I actually feel like, you know, only having this one movie about it, it feels like it needed to be longer. So, hey, I would watch a Scanners Limited series. I think that would be great. That would be a great way to kind of bring it back. (laughs) Two years after Scanners came out, we had Videodrome with James Woods, 1983 a lot it's it disturbed me it's so weird it doesn't always make a lot of sense it has its own kind of internal logic and it definitely is a uh a creepy one it's cr- very it goes in pl- directions i did not expect that definitely weirded me out when i watched it <laughs> yeah you know who's in that debbie harry uh who of course yes. uh, has had a career successful both as an actress and as a mm-hmm. musician a lot of people don't realize that Debbie Harry is from the town that I live in, Cooperstown, New York. Is she? That's so yeah. cool. Yeah. Aww. Never met her, but uh, my wife, who was working at a pharmacy on Main Street, uh, did meet her uh, a few times uh, when she would come into the store. And uh, she would commonly you know, be seen walking around. Her parents were from the area for many, many years. Um, from, from what I've heard, very she was very down to earth. Um, and of course, a lot of people didn't know that she'd become this very famous actress and musician as, as the lead of Blondie, but, uh, she does a nice job in in the movie. She's really a good actress. Really good actress. Yeah. I think she's underrated as an actress, but she does a great job. You would never know that this isn't what she does, you know, full time for a living. Like you totally buy her as the character. And so, yeah, I would agree. She's, she's probably my favorite part of the movie. I don't think she's in it quite enough, but I do like her, her character in it a lot. And then Gwendolyn, one more Cronenberg movie, which is not body horror, but I think is a great film. Also from 1983, The Dead Zone. Ah, yes. You know, it's interesting. I always forget that that's Cronenberg until I'm watching go through my, like I'm going through Cronenberg's filmography and like that's right he did the dead zone I think it's actually one of the better Stephen King adaptations like my favorite Stephen King adaptation is Carrie far and away De Palma it's actually one of my favorite movies of all time um but I actually think the dead zone is a really it's very effective and it's very sad. It's a very heartbreaking movie. And I really, you know, and again, Christopher Walken isn't normally the type of actor that you're like, oh, he broke my heart in that. That's not usually the thing you say of Christopher Walken, but he really did in that. I really, I really believed him in, in that role. And it's Brooke Adams, right? As the actress, she's, right. The, she's the actress in it. Because when I saw it for the first time as a kid, for some reason, I thought she was Karen Allen. I guess I had watched Raiders of the Lost Ark too recently. And so for years, if you would have asked me, I would have said, oh, Karen, like, I have to be like, no, it's Brooke Adams. Like, you have to, like, if you're talking about this to somebody, somebody's gonna be like, no, Karen Allen was not in that movie. But yeah. It's a weird childhood, right? Childhood. Yeah, but it is. Yeah. That's a great one. That's a great one. I'm glad you brought that one up because I was like, you said one more. And from that that year, I'm like, is it Dead Ringers? Where are we going to go? And I'm glad you brought up the Dead Zone because I think it does show that, you know, David Cronenberg has a lot more range than maybe just body horror. Yeah. Walken is very sympathetic. He's the heroic yes. Johnny Smith. Comes back from being in a coma for many years. And then on the other side of the spectrum, the villain is Martin Sheen, who is as devious as they come. Yes, he's he's quite scary in that. He's quite scary. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you, you're really rooting for Walken. And um, even though the ending is a little bittersweet, uh, it, yeah. it, it, it's a satisfying ending and, and really uh, a great film. Just just a few of the movies of Cronenberg that I wanted to get your your thoughts on. Gwendolyn, as we get set to wrap up the show, uh, let's get back to your book, uh, brand new, The Haunting of Velkwood. What is the best way for fans to purchase a copy of this latest novel? You know, you can pick it up pretty much anywhere. If you like Amazon, that's fine. If, you know, Barnes and Noble, local bookstores should be carrying it or you can order it there. So absolutely anywhere, really, anywhere that sells books. (laughs) And your website too, right? Yeah, I mean, I have links up there. Yep, yep. GwendolynKeist.com. You can definitely find links to different places to pick it up. Yeah. Are there any ways for fans to get signed copies? Yes. Through Riverstone Books out of Pittsburgh. They're currently doing the pre-order campaign. But yeah, I'm sure that if you wanted to order in, you know, a personalized copy through there, they could let me know and I could come up and absolutely, absolutely. Um, so are are you working any on any current projects that you can talk about or any appearances like book tours coming up 
I am I am on a book tour. Like I'm starting next week with a launch party at Riverstone Books in Pittsburgh. I'll also be at Loganberry Books in Cleveland and Karis Books in Atlanta. And then I'm doing some online events, you know, virtual events for anyone who can't make it out to those cities. I'm also going to be at Midtown uh, Book Scholar in uh, Harrisburg. And then the Greater Pittsburgh Festival of Books in May. So I'm going to be kind of all over for a couple of months. And then in terms of projects, working on finishing a novella and a novel. Those are my big things for this year. So hopefully we'll have those done in the next few months. That's the goal. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Oh, this has been fascinating. Thank you for sharing all of this great stuff with us. I love the town of Pittsburgh also, where, where you're from and where Riverstone is located. Pittsburgh has some great horror connections. George Romero, of course, uh, used to live there, did Night of the Living Dead there, did other films there. And the great character actor, Tom Atkins, also lives in Pittsburgh, too. I don't know if you know him, but uh, he's a guy I've had I, You know what? Doing. Let's bring this back around to Sharon Tate. When I went to see Once Upon a Time in Hollywood on opening night at this like Pittsburgh theater, Tom Atkins was in. He, Tom Atkins saw Once Upon a Time in Hollywood on opening night. I can say that because he was in the theater where I went to see it. So yes, I definitely know Tom Atkins. And like, I was with my dad. And so of course, my dad had to say something. And he's like, sir, I would rather be watching your movie tonight, not this one, because I like dragged my dad to see Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And, and Tom Atkins is like, oh, like, Halloween three. And we're like, yes, definitely. So yeah, so Tom Atkins, you know, very much a wonderful staple of Pittsburgh. We are very proud to have him. So you did get to talk to him? Very briefly, very briefly, yeah. yes. I didn't want to bother him. He's out there with his family watching a movie. But yeah, we did get to tell him how much we liked his movies. So yeah. Yeah, he's great. Cool. I, I was lucky enough to interview him at a convention a few years ago. And he had, you know, he's in his 80s now, but his recall of his career and his love of horror films oh, yeah. really shines through. He's, uh, he's oh, really yeah. terrific. Yeah. Absolutely. Gwendolyn, we want to thank you for spending an hour with us. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, again, the book is The Haunting of Velkwood, brand new as of March 2024, now available at stores and online. Gwendolyn, thank you and best of luck with the book. Thank you for having me. This was lovely. Again, our guest has been the uh, standout author, Gwendolyn Keist, uh, seven books, including the newest, The Haunting of Velkwood. We thank Gwendolyn for joining us. Thank Tracy as well for co-hosting and producing the show. And we, of course, thank all of the listeners for joining us in this Museum of the Macabre. We hope we'll see you again next time right here in the Ghostly Gallery.